Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> also, good morning to those who are at home watching online. I heard that you got cameras, many, many cameras. I will focus on the main camera here when I need to see. And it's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, great greetings from Oklahoma Conference, Elder Shires and Mr. Will. We all are doing well in the midst of this uh, pandemic and in the midst of this new, whatever we, I hear that there's another generation coming up, so God has to be in control. We just have to move on. And also, it's hard as the leaders, leaders of the conference and hearing all the news that happening around the conference, and especially when we hear the losing friends, losing person that I worked with, it's really hard. I have a friend when I moved down here into Oklahoma in 1984, and I attended the Midway City Church at the time. We call the International Church now, and we were <clears throat> building up the church, putting the foundation and singers. At the time, there were the three elders working very hard, working together, and there is a strong unity, and the church was growing. And I heard that one of the elders passed away a few years ago. Then I heard that a second elder passed away a few months ago. Then I heard last week that last elder that I worked is in the hospital ICU fighting with the COVID. And uh, he had a ventilator and uh, they were not quite sure he's going to make it. So we prayed. Conference-wise, we, I asked everybody to pray for him. And I heard the news that now he's awake and uh, at least he can communicate some way, not through his uh, voice, still a lot of tubes going through his voice, he can't say much, but he, he's aware and uh, kind of communicating some way. I was excited to hear that. But when I heard the first time, I said, Lord, please do not take him away yet. We've got a lot of things to do. Let me read, uh, before I start, let me read it, John chapter 1 again here. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with him, with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. We know this first, probably some of you memorized. I don't know about you, but I, you know, my, I lost my father when I, year, when I was a year old. So I don't have any history about my father. All I know is through my sisters telling me about him. Because of that, I believe that I, not only because of that, but I believe that I really need to take care of my mother. And she passed away in 19, 2020. But before she passed away, she came to Oklahoma and uh, then he, she moved to Georgia. Her dream was she wanted to see all national parks in the U.S. Said, hello? Okay, Lord, that's what I need to do, I will do. So I bought a minivan. So I can take her anywhere she wants to go. Some years she said, can I bring my friends? I said, yes, mom, you can bring your friends. Then she brings friends. We travel together. First time she didn't want to go to any restaurant because she can't eat any other food except rice. So we went through all this process. <coughs> her favorite national park was Yellowstone National Park. So I took her probably three times there. Then every time I have a friend coming from outside of Oklahoma or US, the first choice, let's go to Yellowstone. 
So I went to Yellowstone, and even when, when I was living in Casper, Wyoming, I was Pathfinder director, and the first camp out was in Yellowstone Park with the 38 Pathfinders. So one year, I was walking, I don't know how many of you have been in Yellowstone, all the faithful guy, geyser, walk, walk sidewalk, you know, you walk path. There's a little wood you can walk. And waiting for the, all the faithful guys to come up. My camera was on my neck. You know, I took camera many times. I mean, took probably a thousand pictures. Yet I took a camera. That's tradition, right? When you go to National Park, you cannot go there without the cameras. So I had a nice camera hanging on my neck, walking that walking path. Walking alone, far one waiting, and uh, here one man is walking beside me. So I said, hello. He said, hello. Then he said, where are you from? I said, from Oklahoma, how about you? Oh, I'm from California. Oh, good. So how is California? And how is Oklahoma? So I said, is this your first time in Yellowstone? He said, no. Second time? He said, no. So how many times have you been here? I've been here about over 10 times. Oh. He said, probably I can count probably over 20 times. I said, yeah, there's somebody there who knows about the yellow. So we'll start talking. <clears throat> then he said, I don't come to Yellowstone with a camera. I'm looking at him and I said, what do you mean? You're coming to Yellowstone without the camera. What are you doing? Then I looked at him. He has no camera on his neck. Then he said, until you really know about the Yellowstone, he said he brought the camera. Everywhere he goes, took pictures. Everywhere, took every geyser that he went, took pictures. Even every time he comes, he was patiently waiting. It was a 15, every 15 minutes, all the faithful coming up. But now it's every maybe one hour, 30 minutes. You have to wait. But he was waiting beside that all the faithful guys to take pictures. But now he said, I don't have a camera. OK, well, you must have a lot of pictures. So you don't need a camera to take any pictures. He said, oh, no, no, that's not the reason why I didn't bring my camera. The reason why I didn't bring my camera because I learned how to see the Yellowstone National Park. I got a little lost. What do you mean you learned how to see? Yellowstone Park is Yellowstone Park, and all the faithful or waterfall or you know, Yellowstone Lake. And what do you mean you learned and about the Yellowstone? He said, when you have cameras, you're too busy to take pictures. Now you bring your family or friends, and you just let them say, stay there, let me take pictures, and all that. But then you really don't have connections with the park. My eyes are opening, my ears are opening. OK, what do you mean connections with the park? Park is just there for us to take pictures, isn't it? He said, no. When you have the connections with the park from your heart, you don't need a camera. OK, now you're getting pretty deep here. OK, tell me, what do you mean? He said he's taking every year two weeks vacation to come to Yellowstone Park without the cameras. Then he really enjoying the beauty of a park because he's connected. He's just taking time to walk and see the real beauty of the national park. Then he said, try that. You come here one year without the camera, and then you walked all this national park, I mean, Yellowstone Park, and see what you're going to find it. OK, I'm going to try that. So next opportunity came. It was my best buddy from 
he was there. Then he was there in California, but now he's in Tennessee. He came to see me and he said, let's take me to the Yellowstone Park because he knows that I am the experts of National Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park. I can name all the geysers. I can tell you where is the entry, best entry. I can tell you that you need to go to the Cody and uh, go into the east gate. You have to know that exactly right after sunrise, you have to go so you can see the color of the canyon. So he knew I was the expert. So he called me, taking me to the Yellowstone Park. So I said, are you coming by, by yourself or are you coming with your wife? He said, I'm taking, I'm bringing my wife. Okay, so I'm going there by myself. All I'm going to do is to tell you where to go when we get there. I'll fix your meal, but I'm not going to walk and take pictures of you. He said, wow, that's weird, you know. What do you mean you're not going to go walk with me? But anyway, he said, okay, as long as you feed me, take me up there, tell me where to go, that's fine. So we arrived there. Arrived there, and now I'm, we stayed in the Cody one evening and then got up early morning and uh, walking that uh, entryway for 30 miles from Cody to the gate and uh, the beauty of the canyon. He said, let's just stop here. I said, for what? He said, I need to take pictures. Okay, go ahead and take pictures. So I stopped. Then I didn't have my camera on my shoulder. He has a camera, heavy camera, and he's taking pictures every corner, every rocks and all that. Then I was walking. Just walk outside of the crowd. Just walk around. Then I looked at the canyon again, the color of the rocks. Yeah, that's the same color. So I'm walking, walking. Well, nothing really different. I don't know what I have to do. Got on the car, drove into the entry gate, paid a fee, walking, and then I see big clouds up there. So anytime when you see the people gather together, there's something there. Because they're, they're looking for something. Bear, moose, elk, uh, animals, whatever. They're there. So he said, stop. Okay? So I stopped. He said, aren't you, not, aren't you coming? I said, no, I'm not going there. You go. You go and take pictures. So they got up, went there, taking pictures. I got out of there again, walked by myself and walking into the woody, woody area. You know what? When everybody's there trying to see that the bear was far, far away, and they have to have the room to even see the bear, but they all think it's wonderful they can see the bear there. But I was walking other side and justify myself and see how I can learn to connect with the park. Guess what? I'm looking and right here, bear is crossing in front of me. Whoa. Then I'm looking there, nobody's seen that, but only me seeing that. I said, wow, maybe this is it. Maybe this is what the guy is telling me. I need to take a time and connecting it. We went to the old faithful geyser again. I can show you a thousand slideshow about the geyser. Beside the old faithful geyser there, there's a small geysers around it. Many, many different geysers. Every time I went there, I was too busy just taking pictures. When you want to take a picture, you know that. You have to step back and just wait right angle and taking pictures. You couldn't see really small things around it. You couldn't see a whole picture of that old faithful geyser area. Walking, 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 finally I realized, whoa, totally different view of Yellowstone I was watching, looking at it. The final stop was Teton National Park. My favorite spot is when you cross the Jenny Lake, climbing up a little bit, they're called Inspiration Point. 
We are looking down from the high and looking down the Jenny Lake with the blue as it can be the water and the pine tree, tall, tall trees around the lake and the boat is crossing from one point to the other. Then behind that is a green pasture, green as it can be and there's a far away mountains. I always say this got to be heaven look like. Without the camera that day, I climbed up. Then I sat under the little tree so I can stay away from the sun. Looking down, then the peace. It's not the beauty of that scenery. It's the peace that came into my heart. Then I hear that this is the beauty of the National Park. Took, took me many, many years, a long time. And I was, actually I was preparing some Yellowstone slideshow. I said, no, that's not my point here. So I'm not going to share with you Yellowstone slideshow. But the point is, when you have connection with that beauty, finally you see the beauty. When you have the open the heart, not just looking through the camera lens or through your eye, when you see things through your heart, there was a true beauty. So that trip, my friend was not happy with me. On the way back, you know, he said, you invited me that Yellowstone is the best place to come. He said, yes, it's a beautiful place, the best place. You are right. So I said, my friend, do you, do you really see the beauty of the park? He said, yeah, I got a lot of pictures. I can prove it. No, you didn't see yet. Then on the way, you know, he's, he's a professor at the theology department in Southern University right now. So he, he and I was talking about the park with a connection of the, I mean, the spiritual side of the lesson that we can learn. So we're talking, talking. I said, this is what I didn't go walk with you. And I was sharing my experience with a little, another man there. Then he said, yes. That's what we're missing in our lives daily. Now he is a professor, so he's teaching me now. He said, That's right. You are definitely right. You are right that we are missing the point that when we look at the world, we are too busy to take pictures. I said, oh, okay. Then we are sharing it. We are too busy to see what angle is the best picture will come out of there. We are too busy to bring people in and stand, let me see, one, two, three, and taking pictures. We had a long evening that evening. Long night, because we're talking how we relating to the world. I learned how to connecting with the Yellowstone National Park. I learned how to connecting with the Teton, Yellowstone, Teton National Park. But what am I learning about the world? This morning, I want you to open the heart that you have. We studied the Deuteronomy last quarter. All the book, chapter 1 to all to, to the end of that Deuteronomy, the main point was love your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and keep his commandment. Are we really connected with the word, with the heart? 
Are we really connected that we don't have the cameras just to take pictures? God is good always, isn't it? He is teaching us many, many lessons. In the beginning was the world, and the world was with God, and the world was God. You know, t- today we talked about the Bible. You know? today I was listening to a sermon on the way here, and, and he said, what is the Bible? What, 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 how can you explain it with the one word with the Bible? Somebody said, the word. Somebody said about God. Somebody said love. In your mind, if you have to say the word in one word, what is it? Somebody asked me, I said, no, everybody said already. They already said it's about God, it's about love, it's about all that. I said, no, no, no. I said it's about the relationship between us and God. It's a connection. He said, yeah, maybe that is true. So let us look at today. Today, John explaining many different ways. You know, other gospels, book of gospel, doesn't say that, but John, it's a different way explaining. And John is explaining the word was God. So it's talk about God. But it's more than just God. So here, and Moses was meeting God in burning bush. God was telling Moses what he needs to do for the Israelites. He gave them all the instructions. You are going to go to Pharaoh to bring my people out of the Egypt. Moses was not quite sure that he is qualified to do that. So Moses is asking God, who am I? Why are you picking me? Who am I? I am just a shepherd here for 40 years in witness. Why are you picking me? God didn't say, Moses, you are, you are trained well in Egypt for 40 years. You went to the special school, and you learned how to fight, you, learned, you are trained to be the leader. No, God did not say that. God did not say anything about Moses. When Moses asked him, why me? All he said is, I am going to be with you. Then Moses said, who are you? What should I say to the Israelites who sent me to there? Here, first time, God is explaining him. I am who I am. But in the book of John, Jesus is describing many times, I am what? So let's go to John chapter 6. The first one. John chapter 6. And this one is happening after he fed 5,000 people, okay? After he fed 5,000 people, he crossed the lake to the other side of the lake. Then he's talking to the people, you know. People experience the miracle. You have to think about this picture right now. People experience, uh, disciples experience the miracle. And when Jesus said, you give them something to eat, don't let them go to the village. And he said, you give them something to eat. And they saw that two fish and five loaves of bread fed over 5,000 people. Now he is coming to the the other side of the lake and asking who he is. Let's look at verse 35, chapter 6, verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and who believes in me shall never thirst. I am bread of the, I am the bread of life. Without my bread, you are going to be hungry. Without me, you are not going to 
have the life. He's clearly saying, I am the bread of life. Now, it's continually he's talking then. He's talking about his uh, ancestors that experienced manna, and he continues reminding him the why he is bread of life. Because without his bread, we, have, we all will die. But he said, with my bread that comes down from heaven, and anyone may eat and not die. Then he's talking second one, okay? He's talking here second one again. So I'm going to go order by order that he is leading to who he is. Chapter 7, chapter 10, verse 7. Chapter 10, verse 7, it says, then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the ship. I was struggling about this one. What do you mean the door of the ship? So I was reading it. What does this mean? And that Jesus is saying he is the door. You know, door is the area that you have to Go through it to get into the other side. When you want to go to the other side, that's the only way you can go through unless you break the windows. He said, I am the door. Meaning, without the, me, without the coming to me, you can go through that place. I am the only one that you can go through me so you can see the Father. So here we go. He's explaining. So, and here he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, that he who does not enter ship fold by the door, that climbs in by the other way. Then man is not just a normal man, what he said. Then man is a thief and a robber. So if you want to go to the kingdom of heaven, I am the only way you can go into the kingdom of heaven. Now he's saying, I am the life of the world. Now he's saying, so, okay, let me, I, I, I skipped one more, sorry. I, I have to go back here. Before I do it, let me read this, okay? And the... Uh, Desire of Ages, page 389, it says, it says, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal savior. Believing that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him, it is by beholding his love by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in, that we are to become the partakers of his nature. What food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes part of our being. So Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal savior. Uh, theologically, knowledge will, theological knowledge will do no good. We must feed upon him, receive him into the hearts to that his life become our life his love, his grace must be assimilated to our lives. When I go to, when I went to the Yellowstone Park, when I claimed myself I am the expert of Yellowstone Park, when I took my camera, took all the pictures, it was not Ill really in my heart. It was outside of my heart and just a day. But until you have that connections, 
you really couldn't see the beauty. Now, same thing. When we have that connections, we're going to come, come back there again. So let me read one more quotation here, page 390, Desire Wages. As your physical life is sustained by food, so our spiritual life is sustained by the word of God. And every soul is to receive life from God's words for himself. As we must eat for ourselves in order to receive nourishment, so we must receive the word for ourselves. We are not to obtain it merely through the medium of, the medium of others' mind. We should carefully study the Bible, asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit, and we may understand his word. We should take one verse and concentrate the mind of the task that access, uh, access trained, the thoughts which God has put in that verse for us, we should dwell upon the thoughts until it become our own. And we know what said the Lord. Until it comes to our heart, until it becomes our own, until you have that connection, the word has no meaning to us. When I read it, I said, Lord, I thought I memorized all the books. I thought I knew all the books. I took pictures. I have evidence. But until you have that connection with the heart, the word's not in you. Sorry that I skipped one. So I'm going to go back to chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 12, it says... John chapter, verse 12 said, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have a, the light of a life. You know, growing up with the three sisters, and youngest one out of all, my oldest one basically raised me. My oldest sister raised me while my mom is doing corporate. Because my father's family was not Adventist. So when my father died and they kicked us out of their family, you're going to church, you're not part of the family. Move out. So I remember walking out home with a blanket, a few pots, a few spoons and chopsticks and left. So the only thing mom could have done is just go and corporate. You know, corporate is not an easy job. Many, many weeks she comes home with the empty hands. She couldn't afford to buy even food. But she did it 35 years to raise us. So one day, mom was out. We are leaving a small house and the blackout, you know, then it's not the reliable electricity. Always blacking out many times. So no power. She was not, my sister was not quite prepared to, for blackout. So we didn't have the lamp. We didn't have anything to light up the house. So we came out. My, I was on top of her back. She was uh, carrying me on her back and coming out of the street. So you can see the moonlight a little bit. I remember, I don't remember all the pictures, but I remember she saying, Jesus, we need a light. That's all she prayed. She was desperate. Then after her prayer, we both fell down on the ground. I thought she tripped something. I thought maybe she was, I was too heavy for her, whatever. We all on the ground and sitting on the ground. 
while we are sitting on the ground, she put her hands on the ground, and she grabbed something. She grabbed something. It was a little different feeling, so she grabbed it. Then we looked at it. A little bit light from the moon, moonlight. It was a candle. It was a candle. Then she said, Wow, Jesus gave us a candle. A little, you know, two, three years old boy didn't know what's going on, but I said, Jesus gave us a candle. Yes, let's go back to the room. So we went, turned the light, candle light on. You know, you don't really understand pure darkness. If you go, you go to the New Mexico, the cave, there is a tour stop. You are st they are stopping and they are turning the lights off. You really see pure darkness. You can even see your hands right in front of your eyes. My room was like that because we have no el electronics, nothing at the time. So there's no LED blinking, nothing. It was a pure dark. We couldn't even walk in the room anywhere. We turned the lights on. You know, candlelight is not that bright when you compare now. We are talking even fresh light, 300 lumens, and now they're talking 1,200 lumens, and so bright. But that one candlelight shine whole room. I thought that was brightest light I can see. Here, yeah, Jesus said, I am, I am the light. Here, yeah, let me, I am the light of the world. So, also, the God created the light force, isn't it, in Genesis? So, it, the light of the world. Without him, without that candle that we found on the street. We couldn't see anything. Without Jesus, we cannot see anything. Then, chapter 10, he said, I'm the door. Then in same chapter 10, verse 11. Let's go back there again. This is uh, chapter 10, verse 11 said, I am the good shepherd. I don't know how many of you read the Psalms 23, book the name of Psalms 23. Describe what shepherd does, describe what sheep is, describing how he works. I had a little goat when I was a little boy. And mom said, this is your pet. I don't know, we can call goat a pet. But I played with it. Played with a little baby goat. So I said, you know, we don't have any wagon pulling, pushing. We don't have any other toys. The only toys we had is going to the street and picking up the rocks or go to the creek and play with the water. No toy. So having that little goat in my life, it was a great toy. So I trained. First train was, you need to learn how to pray. No, you can't teach goat how to pray. I said, yeah, I can try. So, here I am saying, kneel. The goat doesn't know what kneel mean. Then I said, okay, come to on my back. I will give you a piggyback. Come. You know, goat doesn't come on your shoulder like a little baby. But I repeated, repeated, repeated that. One day I said, kneel. And he was not near the, the wheel leg, but he near the phone leg. Then you can see that he is standing like an awkward position, and, and that's a prey. So this goat learned how to kneel. Then, then I said, jump up on my back. I'll give you a piggyback. Come on. Then he jumping on my back so I can carry him. And that relationship building up with the goat 
He's almost like really my pet now. He's going everywhere. He follows me everywhere, and he listens to what I'm saying. So we know all these things, and even we all read Psalms 23. It said, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in the green pasture. Uh, probably, you know, if you had a goat or a sheep, you understand what that means. He leads me beside the still waters. When you have no water nearby, the water is important. I had to walk many blocks to bring a bucket of water for, for mom to cook. So he leads me beside the still water, restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the dark shadow of death, and I will not, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The rod, your rod and your step, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The next one is chapter 11. Okay. Be, be patient. I'm going to, to the last one here. Chapter 11, verse 25, it says, verse 25 says, Jesus, now, you know, Nazareth, Nazareth was dead, and he came to see his family, and his, uh, the sisters are uh, crying out and say, my brother is dead. So, here it says, 20, verse 23, let me start with the 23. Jesus said to her, your, bro your brother will rise again. Then 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She didn't believe it. Then 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me through he may die and shall live. Now we, many are experiencing losing friends, family members. I know, sister here sitting, I know that, how they feel. But here he says, I am the resurrection. And we have a hope, isn't it? We have hope. Losing friends. We have to be strong, be encouraged, because the Lord still is with us. Then chapter 14, verse 6. Chapter 14, verse 6, it says, I am, now Jesus saying who he is. I, his, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have to remember, he's the only way that we can go to the Father. My last one, chapter 14. No, chapter 15, sorry. Chapter 15, verse 1. Say, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me and does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears the fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3. 
You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I am in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Okay, let me read this one first and we'll go. The, the uh, Desire of Age, page 676. The union with the Christ, one formed, must be maintained. He said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in, me, in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. This is no casual touch, no on and on, no off and on connections. The abiding in him is not like Lord, oh yes, I am in the church and serving the people. Tomorrow, maybe I'll be in a different place. It doesn't say, it doesn't say. It's a no casual touch, no on and off connections. The branch becomes a part of the living vine. The communication of a life, strength, and fruitfulness from the roots to the branches in unobstructed and constant. I was uh, on the way to Loma Linda a few months, a couple of months ago for the Christmas to see my son. So I went down to Houston and from Houston to Loma Linda, long drive. So I said, let's have some Fun. So I said, let's go to the national park. I know we've been through that highway I-10, so there's not national park that we didn't go, but I said, let's stop by the national park. So in the Tucson, Arizona, there is a national park. I call that Big Cactus National Park. <laughs> but the Name of national park is uh, Sa Sa Saguaro. Saguaro. There's no G sound. So we went nearby, followed the GPS. GPS keep going around and around. It didn't take me to the right place. We spent about 15 minutes looking for the road and finally said we cannot rely on GPS. We pulled over the corner of the street and gas station. My son and my wife is not even moving. I said, aren't you going to ask? No, you go in there. Okay, part went in. So I said, Saguaro National Park. He looked at me, Saguaro? No, there's no Saguaro National Park here. Yes, yeah, there is. I said, no, there's no Saguaro National Park. So finally, I pulled my telephone out and said, here, here's the place I want to go. Oh, Saguaro. Yeah, yeah, we have that. Okay. Can you tell me? I said, I don't know. Then the, the man next said, oh, I know, I know how to get there. How? I said, you, you are almost there. Just go to the stoplight, go straight two miles, make a right turn. You are right going in there. OK. So finally, we found it, entry, went in, going that eight miles loop there. So we stopped walking and uh, drove around, ready to get into the car, go, keep going to driving. By that time, a ranger pulled in. They look at our license plate and say, oh, you're from Oklahoma? Yes. Then I looked at the you know, his uniform, so you're a ranger? Say, yes, I am retired ranger. He was very focusing and said, I am retired ranger serving this park voluntarily. Good. He said, do you need any information about this cactus? He said, yeah, if you have some, give it to me. No, do you have a Pacific one? I said, I don't know, so you tell me. Then he starts 
explaining. Then I said, I, okay, I have a question. <coughs> On there, this way, I went there, I saw white trunk standing all the way high. White, pure white, and it was empty, hollowed inside, standing there. What is it? Is that tree? That tree? He said, no. That is dead cactus. I thought cactus has no trunk inside. I thought that was all just yummy thing, and when you die, just falling down. But it was actually, there was a tree inside of that skin. So he was explaining. Okay, since I asked a question, now he started talking. Cactus root is not that deep. They only hollowed, I mean, that's on the surface. They are not going really deep of the ground. Did you see their white roots coming out of the tree? Yes, that is a root. That's why it died, because when it's not in really deep, it's really hard to get the moisture. But cactus don't need moisture, but sometimes they die. Then he said, cactus grow one inch per year. I said, what? You mean that tall one took that long? He said, yeah, 70 years to grow that tall. Then he's gone. But there's another special one that if you look at it, one, one cactus has a little head on top of the cactus. That's very unusual one. You, you only see a few in the park. Then he said, go there, there's one you will see. So he was explaining all these cactus. Then he said, this is only place in the whole world can grow that cactus. Then I'm looking at why? It's the weather? Yes. It's the ground? Yes. Anything else? Yeah. Wind. I said, what? There's no wind here. There's mountains surrounding. So if you have a strong wind, all cactus will fall because they are not really sturdy the root. Oh, I never looked at that way. Is that the, really because one of the re yeah, one of the reason why that area only can grow because of the weather, ground, and wind. So that's good. When we are not connected to the ground, it dies. Doesn't matter how big you are. In this one, the chapter fifteen, reminding us that we have to have that connection. Abide in me is connected all the time. It's not just one day or one, one hour. It's constant. And that's why I said we have to have that connection moment by moment, not even daily, to receive the nutrition. It's all the time. So here Jesus is talking who he is. You know, this is the seventh saying, I am true vine. That here he says, no, one, more, one more quote here, page 679, 676. Did I wait? Abide in me and in you. Abide in Christ means constant receiving of his spirit. And life of unreserved surrender to his service. You know, we learn all your heart all your soul and strength and mind. That means surrendering totally to Jesus. Here it says again, we have to give surrender to his service. The channel of communication must be open continually between man and God. As the vine branches constantly draw the saps from the living vine, so we, so are we to cling to Jesus and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character. When we have that nutrition coming from Christ, when we have that nutrition coming from the ground, even 70 years continually without when continually they can grow because they are rooted on the ground. And we have rooted on Jesus. Last one here, 
same chapter 15. Verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. When we have that connection, Jesus is finally commanding again that we need to go and bear fruit. When we are grounded on him, when we are abide in him, when we have that connection, then you will see the beauty of the world. That Jesus is with us. And he is the one who is leading and supplying our needs. And that we can receive, then we can impart to others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. We thank you that we have that connection with you, Lord. We have that connection every day, constantly and continually, so we can receive the nutrition from you. That we can bear the fruit, Lord. So may we experience the miracle that you fed 5,000 people with the two fish and five loaves of bread. May we experience that, Lord. It's not that we know how to go and bear fruit. It's not about Moses know how to lead the Israel people. It's about you, Lord. You are the one who's going to provide our needs every day, Lord. And all we need to do is abide in you. So may we experience that miracle every day because you are with us, Lord. We thank you for your grace. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.